Jesus Christ will come again. And there will be a judgment of the world. And we recognise that there's a range of passages through the New Testament pointing to that. Many people today don't believe that because many people today don't believe the Bible. And that's nothing new. Um, you can go over to 2 Peter 3, for instance, and Peter says that there will be those that mock, uh, mock the idea of Christ coming and of judgment because you know, it's taking so long to happen. But Peter goes on to say in the, that chapter that these things are going to happen. The mockers are going to be proven wrong. Uh, I looked uh, online and, and in my files for some statistics on belief in Christ's return and judgment. And I struggled to find anything up to date. <clears throat> I do in my files have a, an old clipping from uh, the Sun Herald here in Sydney and published um, in uh, January 1993. And it made the point that in a survey of 500 adults, only 19% of Australians believe that there would be a second coming of Christ in the 21st century. Uh, now, I know 500 adults is not much of a sampling, but what it's saying is... Uh, in that sampling, 81% of Australians didn't believe that there would be a return of Christ this century. And that's despite the fact that in a survey the previous year, 75% of Australians believed in God. So 75% of Australians believed in God, but only 18 uh, 81 and it around, uh, 81% didn't believe that Christ would return this century. So it is a matter about which people are sceptical. And today I want to consider an earlier prophecy of judgment made about 1,500 years earlier than the New Testament prophecies and have a look at what we can learn from that. <clears throat> We're going to go first of all to Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 33. Around 1440 B.C., uh, God led Israel out of Egypt and about two months later they came to Mount Sinai, otherwise known as Horeb. The Israelites spent something like 11 months there during which time God gave him uh, their, uh, his laws, God gave them his laws and also the guidelines for a national religion. There had not been a national religion for Israel prior to that time. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 26, God went to some length to urge obedience among the people. The same message was given almost 40 years later over in Deuteronomy chapter 28 as Israel prepared to enter the promised land. But we're going to look at the uh, chapter of Leviticus 26. And what we see here in verses 1 to 13 is that God said he would bless his people richly if they were faithful to him. But on the other hand, Leviticus 26 verses 14 to 46, there, there was going to be problems for the people if they persisted in disobeying him. Now that is not just about punishment. What God was saying in Leviticus uh, chapter 26 and Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28 is that he was going to try as hard as he could to keep his people faithful and if they drifted he would send difficulties such as drought and so forth to try to get them to turn back and if that didn't work he would try something else and if that didn't work he would try something else until eventually <clears throat> almost you could say as the last ditch effort he would send them into foreign exile. And that's what we see in Leviticus 26 and verse 33. You, however, I will scatter among the nations and I will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become ruins. So off they would go into captivity 
every other attempt to turn them back had failed. So now God makes this, uh, you could almost say extreme effort to get them to wake up to themselves and to turn back. Well, that's what God warned back somewhere around <clears throat> 1440 BC. What happened up to that time? Well, even whilst they were still at Mount Sinai, there were problems. Because you remember the incident of the golden calf. They'd just been given the Ten Commandments about not making idols and so forth. And here they were doing that very thing, even as God was giving them all of his laws. And then eventually they left Sinai and problems continued, complaining about food and about water. And then the spies went into the promised land and said, yeah, it's a good land, but no, we can't. We can't to defeat the people in that land. And even though Joshua and Caleb called out for trusting God, the people rejected that. And so uh, they were going to spend a total of 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And then finally they came to Canaan and they, they were led into Canaan by Joshua. And then there were more problems. You might remember the sin of Achan disobeying God and taking some of the things uh, in the city of Ai, and uh, sorry, in the city of Jericho, and thus they were defeated at Ai because of that. Well, God forgave and God led them into the full conquest of the land step by step. And then uh, we come to the time of the judges. Uh, which lasted from about 1360 to 1025 BC. And God repeatedly through that time, as you read in the book of Judges, had to send other nations against Israel because repeatedly they'd drift away. Then they'd call out for deliverance and God would deliver them through Judges and then slowly they would drift away again and again and again. We come down to... Uh, 1025 we, we enter the time of the monarchy from 1025 to 931 BC we have the first three kings of Israel Saul, David and then Solomon but Solomon drifted into idolatry and because of his unfaithfulness uh, after his death in 931 BC God caused Israel to split so 10 of the tribes formed the northern kingdom, which retained the name of Israel. Their first king was Jeroboam I. And then the remaining tribes, Judah and Benjamin, along with the Levites, formed the southern kingdom of Judah under the leadership of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Well, Jeroboam immediately led the northern kingdom into idolatry in fact that was made the state religion and that's the way it continued for the next something like 209 years and uh, after 720 years had passed since they were gathered at sinai and heard god's warnings and so forth the warning of captivity came to pass the kingdom was taken into assyrian captivity somewhere around 722 bc in fact we read of that over in second kings chapter 17 verses 6 and 7 uh, in the ninth year of hoshea the last king of the northern kingdom of israel the king of Assyria captured Samaria and led the people of Israel into exile to Assyria and settled them in Halah and Habor on the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Now this came about because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up from the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt and they had feared other gods it followed under other gods and had done so from the establishment of the northern kingdom. 
So a long time has passed, centuries have passed, but God's warning came to be fulfilled. And the northern kingdom, as I say, went off into exile. That just left the southern kingdom of Judah, which would continue for another 136 years thereabouts. Now, during that time, there was a mixture of kings and uh, circumstances in that southern kingdom of Judah. Sometimes there were good kings and they rallied the people, they restored the people and there was faithfulness to God, but then there'd be bad kings and the people would again drift away. And this went on uh, throughout that period of time. Good kings, bad kings, faithfulness, unfaithfulness. Uh, the last good king of Judah was Josiah. He reigned about 639-609 BC. But after him, there were four more kings of Judah and they were all evil, just as various kings had been before them. And what God did throughout that time was to send prophet after prophet after prophet to try to turn uh, the people of Judah back to him. For instance, we go over a couple of pages at 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 16 through 18. And here we have Isaiah speaking during the reign of Hezekiah. This was somewhere around 701 BC, so 20 years after the northern kingdom fell. Uh, 2 Kings 20 verse 16, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when everything that is in your house and what your fathers have stored up to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will come from you, whom you will father, will be taken away and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. So here's the warning that Babylon is going to come. And then we can go over to the book of Habakkuk uh, towards the end of the Old Testament. <clears throat> uh, five books before the end of the Old Testament. And uh, look here at Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. Look among the nations, watch, be horrified, be frightened, speechless. For I am accomplishing a work in your days. You would not believe it even if you were told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, now they are the Babylonians, that grim and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to take possession of the dwelling places that are not theirs. And so it goes on. Now we haven't got a, a date in the book of Habakkuk to say exactly when this was, but because of the information within the book, it's thought that Habakkuk may have been acting as a prophet, perhaps in the reign of Josiah, somewhere between about 639 and 609 BC, or probably, possibly in the reign of Jehoiakim, who followed after and reigned from 609 to 597 BC. But anyway, again, God sends a prophet to warn them. Then we go to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25, beginning in verse 1. And we come now to the uh, uh, reign of Jehoiakim. And God again gives a warning. Uh, this would be somewhere around 606 BC. Jeremiah 25, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the word which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, these 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again. But you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, Turn now, every one, from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds, and live on the land which the Lord has given you 
and your forefathers forever and ever. And do not follow other gods to serve them and to worship them. And do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, in order to provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. And it goes on to say in verse 9 that God will send Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, against them. And that's just a few of the prophecies. But God is trying again and again to reach out to the people, to draw them back. Now, as I said a while ago, the northern kingdom of Israel went into Assyrian captivity around 722 BC. The Assyrian Empire fell to the Babylonians and the Medes in a series of attacks against the Assyrian cities between about 1616 and 609 BC. Um, thus we see uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire arise. The Babylonians have been around for a while, but again they come into the ascendancy. And that empire would last about 70 years until they fell to the Medes and the Persians in 539 BC. I'm, I'm giving you dates to show that this is history. It's not myth. God would use the Babylonians to bring judgment upon Judah. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon besieged Jerusalem in the third year of Judah's king Jehoiakim, so around 606 BC. Uh, the king was temporarily taken captive and then released. And Daniel was among those who were taken into Babylonian captivity at that time. After the end of King Jehoiakim's 11-year reign in Jerusalem, his son Jehoiachin became king of Judah. He reigned for just three months. Uh, this has brought us to 597 BC. The Babylonians launched a second siege. 10,000 Jews were taken into Babylonian exile, and that included uh, the prophet Ezekiel. And then Nebuchadnezzar made Jehoiachin's uncle, Mataniah, uh, king of Judah, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, would reign 11 years from 597 to 606 BC. And in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, that is around 588 BC, the Babylonians launch uh, a third siege of Jerusalem, which would last for about 18 months. Jerusalem fell and was burned in 586 BC, and many more Jews at that time were taken into Babylonian captivity. So the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah uh, both fell uh, and were taken into captivity. That brought us to a time of about 850 years after God had given his warnings at Sinai, but the passage of so long a time made no difference. God says this is what will happen and that is what indeed happened. God's warning was fulfilled and judgment had come. It would not be until about 536 BC that the first exiles would return to Judah from Babylon. Come over to Acts 17 verses 30 and 31 because an obvious application from this is that God does keep his word. That's both promises and warnings. And if God says there's going to be a judgment, there will be a judgment. Uh, uh, Paul talked about this when he was in Athens on his second missionary journey, Acts 17 and verse 30. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. 
we talked about the resurrection just recently and that speaking of Jesus Christ and God is going to judge the world so there's a need to be prepared for that and just as it happened in the Old Testament so it will happen again but there's something else regarding confirmation that I want to see and, and we're going to go back to Jeremiah this time to Jeremiah chapter 34 verses uh, 6 and 7 Jeremiah 34 verse 6 and 7 and Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah king of Judah in Jerusalem when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and the, all the remaining cities of Judah uh, that that is Lachish and Azekar for they alone remained as fortified cities among the cities of Judah so we've got the information here that Zedekiah is king he was the last king of Judah Babylon is fighting against Jerusalem so that brings us to the third siege of Jerusalem between 588 and 586 BC and Jeremiah speaks to Zedekiah the king so it's not long before uh, Jerusalem and Judah are going to fall completely to the Babylonians there's something here that it's easy to overlook it says in verse 7 that the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and all the remaining cities of Judah that is Lachish and Azekar that doesn't mean very much to us but there's there's something interesting from that um, Lachish was situated something like 40 kilometers southwest of Jerusalem and the site of the city has been identified and it has been excavated by archaeologists since 1935 there have been a number of finds there on in the site of Lachish and that includes a series of letters written on pottery in ink and these pottery remnants are referred to as Ostrika and um, in his book more evidence that demands a verdict Josh McDowell discusses the the nature and the significance of these finds the so-called Lakish letters are dated in the time of King Zedekiah and the siege of Jerusalem Lakish and Azekar are mentioned in those archaeological finds so the Bible isn't making up those names they were real places and in fact um, it is said in one of the uh, letters uh, that uh, Lake, uh, Lakish is sending out fire signals but nothing has been heard, seen from Azekar so they will here is the Babylonians pressing in and a lot of the towns have been conquered there had been Azekar and Lakish but now it's reached the point where there's no signals coming from Azekar so that just leaves Lakish and of course uh, Jerusalem a further find there by archaeologists was the imprint of a clay seal which refers to and I quote get a liar who is over the house unquote now if you go on to Jeremiah chapter 40 get a liar was appointed governor of Judah by the victors by the Persians and you read about him unfortunately he got assassinated after a short time uh, furthermore research on the site of Lachish has found uh, that it had been twice burned within a short period of time coinciding with the, uh, the, the uh, besieging of Jerusalem so Lachish fell as well and was burned just like Jerusalem was burned so the point here is that the biblical 
description of events surrounding the fall of Judah and Jerusalem, God's judgment on Judah and Jerusalem, are not only a fulfillment of God's warnings given 800 plus years earlier, but also they are historically accurate as archaeology has shown to us. So God's word in this is doubly reliable. It's reliable in terms of the fulfillment of God's warnings and reliable in terms of the archaeological evidence for the fulfillment of those warnings. <clears throat> so a key point, as I've said over and over again uh, during the years, is that the Bible is not a book of myths, of legends, of fairy stories. The Bible is a book of historical and geographical and biographical uh, fact. Archaeology is a science that shows that to be so. Many, many details in the Bible are backed up by history and archaeology. You can't believe the Bible. It's not fairy stories. And prophecies in the Bible both promises and also warnings are therefore reliable. Now long periods of time may pass sometimes between the giving of a prophecy and the fulfilment of that prophecy. And sometimes because it takes so long, people think oh, it's not going to happen. But the Bible shows again and again prophecy does get fulfilled even though long periods of time have passed. And you have to realise that it points out in Second Peter chapter 3 that often there's long periods of time because of God's grace and mercy. God is giving time for people to turn back. And God may be trying repeatedly to get people to turn back. But the message is there for us just as the message was there for Old Testament Israel. God says such as in Acts chapter 17, there will be a judgment. Therefore, we need to repent. We need to be committed to God. We need to follow him faithfully and not allow ourselves to drift away. And if we have drifted, we need to turn back as God has uh, allowed us and enabled us to do so. So the question is, Will we take note of God's word? Will we take note of God's promises? Will we take note of God's warnings? Say, so this is truth. This is reality. I need to take it seriously. I need to commit myself to that. Whether by faith and repentance and baptism, if we haven't previously done so, or by turning back and confessing our sins to God and seeking his forgiveness, which he has promised, and thereafter trying our very best with one another's help to walk faithfully with God. What decision are we going to make? Just stand and sing.